Good morning students. In this unprecedented situation, we have to resort to this online class, but we'll continue with what was being taught in the offline classes and we continue with the corneal diseases. The learning objectives of this session would be to identify basic features of primary and recurrent herpes simplex infection of the eye and plan management. To diagnose a case of herpes zoster ophthalmicus and acanthamoeba keratitis. To understand the different types of trophic keratitis. To diagnose, classify and manage a case of vitamin A deficiency. To identify and manage common immunological disorders of the cornea. To recapitulate, I would like to point out that signs and symptoms in bacterial, fungal ulcer are different. In bacterial corneal ulcer, there are proportionate signs and symptoms, while in fungal corneal ulcer, signs are more than symptoms. Here on the right side, you see a patient with a corneal ulcer, there is a markedly congested eye with corneal ulcer and a hypopion. A patient of fungal ulcer would have a lot of signs and very little symptoms, whereas they are proportionate in bacterial corneal ulcer. Since we are going to talk of viral corneal ulcer today, right at the beginning, I want to tell you that the symptoms are much more than signs. Now, beginning with the viral infections of the cornea, the causative organisms could be herpes simplex, herpes zoster, and rarely measles and mumps. The herpes simplex virus and the varicella zoster virus they establish in the neurons of trigeminal ganglion. The HSV1 affects above the waist while HSV2 below the waist. The herpes simplex infection of eye could either be primary herpes or recurrent herpes. The characteristic features of primary herpes include a blepharoconjunctivitis which is the typical manifestation and the response in the palpebral conjunctiva is follicular. In addition, there may be vesicles on the skin of eyelid margin and rarely the patient develops epithelial keratitis. Here you can see a patient having vesicular lesions of the skin and on the lid margin and on the other side you see a cornea where there are multiple areas of fluorescent staining, punctate areas are there. These could be because of primary herpes infection. While a recurrent herpes virus infection is because of reactivation of the virus in the trigeminal ganglion and it moves down to the sensory nerve endings. Once it comes down, it can involve cornea, uveal tract, trabecular meshwork, retina and even optic nerve. It is typically unilateral. The clinical presentation would be the symptoms are pain, redness, watering, photophobia and decreased vision. And the signs would be circumcorneal congestion, typical corneal ulceration and the hallmark in the diagnosis of herpes infection is decreased corneal sensations. There are different types of recurrent herpes infection manifestations and these include epithelial keratitis, dyskiform keratitis, stromal keratitis, metahepatic ulcer and aridocyclitis. In the epithelial keratitis, there may be punctate lesions which may lead later on coalesce into one or more arborizing dendritic epithelial ulcer. 
these dendrites have terminal knobs and they are very typical of herpes simplex keratitis. Now once you stain these dendrites with rose bengal and fluorescein, the bed of the ulcer that stains with fluorescein because of the loss of cellular integrity and absence of intercellular tight junctions, whereas the margins of the ulcer are stained by rose bengal because of the presence of dead and devitalized epithelial tissue in this area. Once a patient of epithelial keratitis is exposed to steroids, he may get a large ulcer which is given the name of geographic epithelial ulcer or an amoeboid ulcer. Here on these slides you can see typical dendritic pattern. You have the dendrites which are stained with the fluorescein and being seen with the cobalt blue light on the slit lamp on the right side. And on the left side, you can see a ulcer which has been stained by rose bengal. Now this slide shows a large ulcer and this is named as a geographical corneal ulcer. See, you observe a lot of the epithelium has been lost and now it is, there is no longer a dendritic pattern. Following resolution, scarring may be seen just beneath the area of prior epithelial ulceration. Once the epithelial keratitis heals, there may be reduction in corneal sensations. The treatment of epithelial keratitis is by antivirals and most of the time we use acyclovir eye ointment five times a day for nearly two weeks. Sometimes oral antivirals are also given along with cyclo and cycloplegics are needed. Healing usually occurs in two weeks and steroids are contraindicated. Other ocular manifestations of frequent herpes include stromal keratitis. It is because of active viral invasion of the stoma and presents as haze or whitening of the stoma due to areas of necrosis. Stomal edema may accompany the haze. Then we have disciform keratitis. It is because of immune reaction and delayed hypersensitivity leading to endothelial damage which results in stromal edema. The third category is a metahepatic ulceration. These are not active ulcers and they usually follow active viral disease. The reason for these ulceration is that the epithelium cannot hold on to the basement membrane and the woman's layer. Then we can have aridocyclitis and a long-standing or recurrent herpes simplex viral keratitis may be associated with corneal vascularization. Now here you see two pictures of disciform keratitis. You see the there is a disc shaped central lesion where the cornea is hazy and if you see on the other side where there is a slit beam you can find out that the central area of the cornea is thickened. The periphery normally is thicker, but here you can see the central area is thicker. The treatment of stromal keratitis and disciform keratitis is comparatively more complex as compared to epithelial keratitis, and you have to use oral antivirals, topical antivirals, and in addition, topical steroids also. In epithelial keratitis, topical steroids are contraindicated. Here you may have to use and the treatment may last for several weeks. Then metahepatic ulcer. As we discussed that this is not because of the active viral infection but because of the healing problem. So you do not need to use antivirals in this but you use tear substitutes, soft bandage contact lens or you may have to use 
the surgical procedure of tarsorephy and we'll see tarsorephy in one of the subsequent slides. This slide shows ulceration and this ulcer is not because of a patient having active viral disease but where the healing is now impeded. Then a patient of herpes simplex may have granulomatous or non-granulomatous aridocyclitis. Once we will discuss UV apart, you will come to know what is a granulomatous and what is a non-granulomatous uveitis. In the last classes, we had talked of keratic precipitates on the back of cornea and they may be different in granulomatous and non-granulomatous uveitis. But here, suffice to say that the patient has aridocyclitis. The important thing is there may be elevated intraocular pressure which is caused by trabeculitis and there may be patchy iris transillumination defects. Treatment again has to be by topical antivirals, topical steroids, oral antivirals along with cycloplegics and most of the time we do require IOP lowering agents. Then we have another manifestation of the viral disease and this is herpes zoster ophthalmicus. The ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve is affected here. This disease may be characterized by fear, unilateral headache, malaise, paresthesia and vesicular eruptions in the involved dermatome. Sometimes you can make a diagnosis even prior to eruptions a typical unilateral pain. The patient comes with pain, with paresthesia and looking at the picture that it is only on one side of the face and the forehead, you can make a presumed diagnosis even before the eruptions appear. The nerves which are commonly involved are the supraorbital, supratrochlear and infratrochlear branches while the infraorbital is rarely involved. Inflammation of almost any ocular tissue can occur and reoccur in herpes zoster ophthalmicus and this may include episcleritis, scleritis, uveitis, glaucoma, retinal necrosis, optic neuritis and nerve palsies which may involve third, fourth or sixth cranial nerve. The zoster dermatitis which may be very severe at times may result in large scabs that resolve slowly and may leave significant scarring. The herpes zoster ophthalmicus may have both punctate and dendritic epithelial keratitis but the dendrites what in herpes zoster are called the pseudodendrites because they do not resemble the typical dendrites in a case of herpes simplex viral keratitis and they form branching lesions, they are more peripheral, stellate and they stain minimally with fluorescein and rosewing gall and they do not have the classical knobbed ends but rather are blunt at their ends. Then they may be numular or coin shaped corneal infiltrates in herpes zoster keratitis. It's Im important to remember that if the tip of nose is involved, there is likelihood of corneal involvement and this is because of involvement of nasociliary nerve. This rule is called Hutchinson's rule. It is not infallible. Sometime the tip may be involved, still cornea may not be involved and sometime without the involvement of the tip of the nose, cornea may get involved. Now here you see photographs where a patient has vesicular eruptions on one side of the face and involvement of the tip of the nose, this marked edema where the lids are closed and this sort of edema, this sort of vesicular eruption is commonly seen. Sometimes it can be more severe than this also. And on the right side you see very typically that only one side of the face and forehead is involved and now the scabs are there, they are not crossing the midline. 
This slide shows a numular keratitis with multiple lesions in the stroma of the cornea. The treatment of herpes zoster ophthalmicus is with acyclovir 800 mg 5 times a day for 10 to 14 days or velocyclovir 500 mg 3 times a day for similar duration. Oral antiviral therapy for herpes zoster ophthalmicus reduces viral shedding, has recovery and decreases the incidence and severity of the common ocular complications which include post hepatic neuralgia. Topicals may be needed for skin lesion, zinc calamine lotion and for pain analgesics are required. Then there can be protozoal infection of the cornea in the form of acanthamoeba keratitis. And here on this slide you see a typical appearance of acanthamoeba keratitis where there is a ring infiltrate and it is classically described as ring infiltrate with radial keratoneuritis where the nerves around this ring infiltrate are involved. It is the contact lens wearers who are at more risk and this is because the solution in which they preserve their contact lens may get contaminated with the canthamoeba. Swimming or bathing in contaminated water may also lead to this infection. Intense pain is an important feature. It can be mistaken for viral keratitis in the initial stages. The diagnosis is by clinical suspicion. From the history, KH mount can be done, culture on E. coli enriched non-nutrient agar and corneal biopsy may help. Treatment, different drugs are tried but treatment may be difficult in this condition and the drugs which may be effective are propamidine isothionate, neomycin, clotrimazole, miconazole. The third group of diseases which we are covering today are trophic keratitis. These are certain conditions which affect the health of cornea making it vulnerable to ulceration and these include exposure keratitis, neurotrophic keratitis and xerophthalmia. Xerophthalmia stands for the ophthalmic manifestations of vitamin A deficiency. Here in this slide you see different eyes with involvement in the lower area at 6 o'clock position where the cornea has become hazy, there is ulceration and there is vascularization also in one or two eyes. The exposure keratitis usually appears at 6 o'clock position as you are seeing in these slides. And it is caused because of lag of thalmos or incomplete closure of the eyes. The eyes do not close properly and this may occur if the eyes are bulged out as in proptosis or there is facial nerve palsy, there is atrophion or patient is in deep coma and is unable to close the eyes. As I told you it begins at 6 o'clock position with the drying of epithelium and the epithelium may get cast off later corneal ulceration may occur. See, it gets infected, it can even lead to perforation and you can imagine a comatose patient having exposure keratitis, developing a corneal ulcer on both the sides and getting perforated and getting blind. So this can be catastrophic. You can prevent it by patching at night, use of artificial tears during day and sometimes tarsal FE is required. On the above photograph you can see a patient who has undergone tarsal FE and what has been done is that the little part of the upper and the lower lids have been sutured together. Now there is narrowing of the palpebral fissure both vertically and horizontally. Since 
the cornea doesn't remain exposed so the corneal lesions heal. Tarsudafy is done in a number of conditions. One condition we discussed in the beginning also, metahepatic ulcer. And the second now here is exposure keratitis. Then neurotrophic keratitis. This occurs in trigeminal nerve paralysis and typically following a treatment of trigeminal neuralgia, which is a very painful condition and you resort to a number of treatment for this condition which includes alcohol injection in the ganglion also. The features of this condition include desquamation of corneal epithelium and the surface of cornea becomes dull and the epithelium is cast off. The stoma then becomes cloudy and a large ulcer forms which is painless as cornea is anesthetic. The ulcer may be very large but because there are no sensation, the patient is not complaining of any pain. You have to treat this condition as corneal ulcer. The protection of eye with shield is mandatory, which we did not discuss when we were talking of bacterial corneal ulcer. And again, tarsorephine, which we have seen in the last slide, may be required in this condition also. This slide shows a photograph of neurotrophic keratitis. We have seen the stroma has become hazy and there is an area where the epithelium is being cast off. A very important condition is xerophthalmia or the ophthalmic manifestations of vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A is received from different dietary sources which includes green leafy vegetables, papaya, carrot, cod liver oil and a number of other sources. This vitamin is required for the epithelium of the respiratory passages, conjunctiva, cornea and also for normal functioning of retina. The deficiency of vitamin A may occur because of poor intake. It can also be precipitated by protein energy malnutrition, liver disease or intercurrent illness which includes diarrhea, measles, etc. The World Health Organization has given a classification for xerophthalmia and here the XN stands for night blindness or nyctalopia where the patient is not able to see well in dim illumination. X1A is conjunctival xerosis, where the conjunctiva gives a dry, leathery appearance. X1B is the bitot spots, which may occur on the nasal and the temporal sides of the cornea and raised triangular foamy patches. Then you have drying of the cornea the cornea no longer retains the sheen and that is corneal xerosis. Patient in X3A dwells corneal ulceration which is less than one third of the cornea and X3B the corneal ulceration or keratoglacia affects more than one third of the cornea and XS stands for corneal scar that means once the corneal ulcer is healed, you have a scar present and then it comes in XS. And XF is xerophthalmic fundus where you may find multiple whitish spots on fundus examination. Now these are the different manifestations of xerophthalmia in this slide. On one side you see bitot spots see some raised foamy areas where the conjunctiva appears dry and see there are certain raised spots and it is presumed that they are because of cornibacterium xerosis which forms small air bubbles and that may be the reason for this appearance of bitot spots. The second slide shows keratomalacia. See the eyes not inflamed at all and you see a pulse ulcer right in the center without any signs of inflammation. 
and on the extreme right is an unfortunate child who has lost both eyes because of vitamin A deficiency and now there is no hope of getting back the vision in any situation. One eye is bulging out because of anterior staphyloma, the other eye also has total corneal involvement and now this I can this child cannot get vision by any means anywhere. The treatment of vitamin A deficiency is very important and has to be instituted in an emergency if we find any corneal ulceration because of xerophthalmia. It is given as two lakh units orally or one lakh intramuscularly if oral drug cannot be retained immediately and repeated the next day and thereafter after two weeks. So this is the regime you follow. If the children are under one year or less than eight kgs, you treat with half the dose. And if the children are below six months, you just give 50,000 units. Women in reproductive age group with night blindness or with conjunctival cirrhosis are treated with 10,000 units of vitamin A orally for two weeks. And if the woman has corneal cirrhosis, full dose of vitamin A is given. A conjunctival cirrhosis is treated as tri eye, that means you give tear substitutes also, and keratomalacia as bacterial corneal ulcer. In addition, you have to treat the underlying cause. Prophylaxis for vitamin A deficiency is very important. The health education about food rich in vitamin A must be given in all the schools and wherever possible to the parents. Fortification of food like milk, vegetable oils and cereals can also be tried. Prophylaxis with vitamin A that is being given every six months, two lakh units of vitamin A. Environmental hygiene to reduce infectious diseases, diarrhea, etc., and immunization against measles. Now, once the child is immunized, he may not get this disease, and vitamin A deficiency may not be precipitated. The fourth group of disorders which we are going to discuss today are immunologically mediated corneal diseases. There's a number of diseases in this and we'll like to talk of some of these. One is flectanular keratitis. There can be flectanular conjunctivitis also. Then marginal ulcer, chronic subvigenous ulcer or Mouren's ulcer or rodent ulcer as we call it. Then interstitial keratitis and peripheral ulcerative keratitis. Flectangular keratitis, in this condition you find small round yellow grade nodules slightly raised above the surface generally seen close to the limbus and in the above photograph you can see one of the flecten at 5 o'clock position on the limbus with the leash of vessels close to it and these occur usually in response to bacterial proteins most of the time tubercular but may occur in cases of tonsils, infection of the tonsils, adenoids or even dental caries. They can be very small, nearly one millimeter and may be difficult to see with the naked eye. As the disease progresses, they become necrotic and a small ulcer forms. If a flectin is present only on the conjunctiva, you may use a steroid antibiotic drops and treat it. A flectin, if it migrates on the corneal surface, is much more symptomatic and may require cycloplegics along with antibiotics and steroids. So once you see a child with a flectin or keratitis, you have to think of, is the child not having any systemic disease? Do we need to rule out tuberculosis in it? 
Then the second immunological mediated colon disease is chronic serpiginous ulcer, Moran's ulcer or rodent ulcer. It's a chronic, painful, progressive ulceration of the peripheral cornea, very difficult to treat, may occur as a benign unilateral form in elderly or a fulminant bilateral form in young. Most of the time it begins in the periphery of the cornea and spreads circumferentially all around and also centipedally. It has an undermined edge or edge of deeper epithelized tissue. Intense pain, photophobia and watering are common features. For treatment you have to try different things. You may use topical corticosteroids. You have to use acetylcysteine, topical cyclosporine, or you may need to use contact lenses, limbal conjunctival excision, systemic steroids, and immunosuppressants. Laminar keratoplasty has also been tried in this condition. This photograph you see a patient having a Moran's ulcer, you have an ulcer on the periphery with an undermined edge and vascularization of the base. Then another important disorder is interstitial keratitis. Interstitial keratitis may occur in different granulomatous diseases which include sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, leprosy, syphilis or may be of idiopathic origin. The classical form of interstitial keratitis is because of congenital syphilis and usually affects children in the age group of 5 to 15 years. You can have a Hutchinson's triad in congenital syphilis which include Hutchinson teeth, interstitial keratitis and sensory neural deafness. The clinical presentation of interstitial keratitis is progressive and in this case initially there may be an appearance of one or more hazy patches in the deep stoma following minor injury and the patient starts complaining of pain, redness, watering and photophobia. These patches, the opaque patches in the corneal stroma, they progress and eventually whole of the cornea assumes ground glass appearance. This stage is called progressive stage. Once the cornea has this steamy ground glass appearance, vascularization begins in the form of radial brush like vessels. Since these vessels are covered by the hazy cornea, they give an appearance of salmon patches, and this stage is called florid stage. Once there is this florid stage, then subsequently clearing starts, and usually it begins from the margin and progresses towards the center. And this stage is called a regressive stage. The vessels get obliterated and get devoid of blood, but they still remain present in the form of streaks without any blood flow in them and these are called ghost vessels. Behind this opaque cornea there is intense uveitis. See, the uveitis is the primary thing. There may be involvement of the iris, ciliary body and even the peripheral area of the choroid. This condition is most of the time bilateral and may take weeks to months to clear. The diagnosis is based on the evidence of congenital syphilis and positive serological reactions. Treatment, systemic treatment with balanceline may shorten the course in addition, you need to give topical steroids, cycloplegics and lubricants. Marginal ulcers. 
this occur due to immune reaction to staphylococcal toxins because of meiopermin gland infection or blepharitis and it's very interesting to note that they occur at the areas where lids are in contact with cornea that is at 4 7 10 and 2 o'clock position typically but they may be present multiple and may be present even all round they are shallow slightly infiltrated often multiple and associated with neurologic pain. In the photograph you are seeing there are multiple infiltrates. You can pick up two, four, five, six, seven in that small area. The treatment of this condition is with topical antibiotics and in addition you need to treat blepharitis and in this photograph you can see the inflammation in the lid also. It's quite marked so probably the infection, the staphylococcal infection is there in the lids and from there the toxins are being liberated and leading to these multiple marginal ulcers in this photograph you are seeing. Sometime you need to give oral doxycycline for a few weeks. Steroids some people may try after the acute part is healed but better avoid it because you know that there is and evidence of staphylococcal infection. So antibiotics are the mainstay. Another difficult to treat immunological condition is peripheral ulcerative keratitis. And this may occur in a number of systemic disorders which include systemic lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, vaginous calomatosis, polyarthritis, Nodosa. In these condition, there may be peripheral ulceration, gutter formation or even melting of the cornea in these areas. This is very difficult to treat, may require topical antibiotics, cycloplegics and lubricants. Systemic immunosuppression may be needed, band-aid contact lenses or cyanoacrylate glue application. May sometimes be required. Cyanoacrylate glue is a glue we usually apply when there is a small perforation and it hardens and covers that surface. Since it is very hard, so it will irritate the eye, so use a soft bandage contact lens on it. Sometimes what we do is excision of adjoining conjunctiva. Once we excise the conjunctiva surrounding this peripheral ulcerative keratitis, it may eliminate the source of collagenases and other inflammatory mediators and may help in healing. Thank you. With this, we end this session. We will continue with the rest of the corneal diseases in the next session.